Then we have the disciples. <clears throat> Think about this. If you were instructed by a person whom you may have only heard about, maybe never even met, to lay down your nets and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now that takes a lot of courage. If somebody approached me, I would think, you're kind of crazy if I didn't know who they were, and they instructed me to do that. Hey, follow me. And then there's our Savior Himself, Christ. I think during His entire life, unselfish courage was continuously at the forefront right until His very end. Now, although there were many scriptures that I could have focused on today that would have displayed courage, the scripture found in Mark 14, I feel, is a perfect illustration. Jesus knows his time's getting short. So he takes his disciples and he goes to Gethsemane. And he takes three of his most trusted disciples, his best friends, a little further into the garden Peter, James, and John. And he tells them he is deeply troubled and he wishes them to keep watch for him while he goes on into the garden to pray. Now Jesus walks in and he falls to the ground and he says, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Wow, can you imagine that? That is a huge, huge dose of courage right there for Christ. Jesus knows his fate's set, and even though his death could be stopped, he knows it can't, and it's weighing very heavily on his mind and on his heart. Now, I don't think Jesus was trying to get out of his task, but I truly think that deep inside... He was searching for another way, searching for some alternatives. He goes to his father and he says, everything's possible for you. Come on, dad, give me some alternatives. What else can happen here? And he's even brought his best friends along for support. You know, they're vigilantly waiting back at the garden for him. Now, Jesus, he returns to his disciples and he finds them asleep. <clears throat> And he says, could you not keep watch for one hour? And I imagine that more was probably said. I mean, I would probably be pretty irate myself. If I asked my good friend John Dolan, hey, come along with me and stay here and wait and keep watch. You know, I've got something I need to do. And I come back and John saw on logs. I might be upset. And I think Jesus was too. His most trusted friends have just let him down in this very troubling time. And he instructs them once again to watch and pray. And he returns to the garden again, probably to see if his father's changed his mind. And as a parent, I have found this really typical of Briley and Sadie. If at first you don't get the answer you're looking for, you try again. Maybe with another parent, maybe you wait an hour or two and you come back and do this. I find this odd because as a child, I never did this at all growing up. <laughs> One of the perplexities of raising kids. <clears throat> now Jesus comes back out of the garden for the second time. And his buddies are asleep again. They just could not keep their eyes open. Now can you imagine the hurt at this point? It says that Jesus goes back into the garden for the third time. Once again to pray. And when he comes back out, his friends are still sleeping. Now this time, if we read on down in the scripture, we read kind of a twinge of disgust in his statement. Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough! The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. And they go. In 1990, I moved to Prescott, Arizona to attend college. My mom and my dad and my soon-to-be wife, they helped me move out and get settled in. And the first week of school, new students were required to stay together at a local camp. Now here we were to be indoctrinated into the Prescott College philosophy of learning and education. And this was my first opportunity to 
I think, really meet and take in my fellow classmates. Now, Prescott College is not your typical run-of-the-mill university. It was a non-traditional university by standards. And their philosophy of learning was based on experiential education. And it was one of the top environmental schools in the nation. And so it drew a very unique type of student. The student body was, was very unique. When I had visited the school with my parents about two summers prior on a family vacation, we didn't get a real feel for what the student population was like because most had gone home for the summer, gone on to jobs. So I was really in the dark about the personalities I would meet. But now at Friendly Pines Camp, I was getting a real good feel, and it made me uneasy. It's probably one of the uneasiest times of my life. You see, being from a small town in the Midwest and raised on a farm, I was pretty sheltered to the rest of the world and hadn't really been exposed to, to a lot of the personality types I was going to meet. Now, you have to keep in mind the time frame for me being 1990, but I was exposed to vegetarians, vegans, multiple body part piercings, exotic tattoos. Now, this is commonplace now, but uh, not so much in, in even 1990 time frame. Bongo drums and tambourines, hair colored pink or green. Dreadlocks. Now that was an interesting experience. It reminded me one time when the mayor got in the cocklebur patch. <laughs> People of different nationalities, different religions. People who drank herbal tea, burned incense, believed in being all natural, even the ladies. Tai Chi, yoga. And people who absolutely despised someone who hunted, who enjoyed a nice steak, or who even had the audacity to keep livestock and raise livestock. My only exposure to some of these perceived oddities had been through television or possibly on one of our vacations out west. It was pretty much cultural shock for me. I think uh, those of you sitting in the congregation who truly experienced the 60s, you know, know the type I'm talking about. <laughs> and, uh, you know, know all about them, you know, kind of hippie types, you know, want to be hippies, uh, greenies, tree huggers, nature's children, a lot of different names for them. And they were all here at Friendly Pines Camp, and I was amongst them. And I did not fit in. I was the proverbial sore thumb we always talk about. I stuck out. But I suppose I was kind of an oddity to them as well. 